I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit today about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. It's better known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and many of you probably are familiar with Lou Gehrig. He was a, a Hall of Fame baseball player that played for the Yankees back in the 20s and 30s. And Lou Gehrig's nickname was the Iron Horse. He established the record for the most consecutive games played at 2,130, a record that lasted for nearly six decades in the major leagues. At one point towards the end of his career, some doctors x-rayed Lou Gehrig's hands and found that he had played through 17 different fractures during that time. This was one tough guy and a supreme athlete. In 1939, on his birthday, he was diagnosed with ALS. And a short, less than two years later, he succumbed to this terrible disease. Now, Lou Gehrig's life story is truly a tragedy. But perhaps what is more of a tragedy is that in the 70 years since then, the prognosis for a patient diagnosed with ALS today is no different than it was for Lou Gehrig. So what is ALS? It's a progressive neurodegenerative disease that attacks the motor neurons in the brain and spinal cord. This leads to muscle weakness and atrophy, paralysis, and ultimately and inevitably death due to respiratory failure. The average life expectancy for ALS patients is two to five years. There are two major types of ALS, a genetic or familial inherited form, which accounts for a very small proportion of ALS uh, cases, and a gene that is mutated in uh, some majority of these is called SOD1. The vast majority of cases of ALS are what we call sporadic, which means that scientists and medical researchers literally do not have a clue what causes it. The underlying pathophysiology of ALS involves an initial loss and degeneration of axons from the motor neurons that innervate your skeletal voluntary muscles. This leads to muscle wasting. The, the motor neurons themselves within the spinal cord and brain also die during this disease. There's also a large inflammatory component where cells known as reactive astrocytes and microglial cells infiltrate the spinal cord and cause damage to the motor neurons. If we compare the incidence and prevalence of ALS to other common neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, you can see ALS is really a relatively rare disease with at any given time only about 30,000 patients in the U.S. being diagnosed with this disorder. This has resulted in relatively fewer clinical trials and only one FDA-approved drug for ALS. This is in stark contrast to things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, where at least there are several reasonable palliative therapies. There literally is no good therapy for ALS patients. The National Institutes of Health has funded ALS research at a relatively stable level of 30 to $50 million a year. But if you compare that to something like Alzheimer's disease, you can see it's a paltry 10% of the funding that Alzheimer's research receives. The current status of care for ALS, you're looking at it. One pill, Riluzol. This drug is minimally effective. It basically prolongs lifespan for three months. Unfortunately, the FDA approval process can take upwards of a decade. So the chance that in the near term for patients that have ALS now that a new FDA-approved therapy is going to become available is very bleak. So I call this all this a disappointing equation for ALS patients. You have a relatively rare but invariably fatal disease that receives limited research funding, minimal interest from big pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies because there's no profit margin, and there's a dearth of approved or effective therapies. This has led to a lack of hope and feelings of desperation for patients and their families. Because of this, many ALS patients have turned to unproven dietary supplements as a means of medicating themselves. This is just a partial list that I obtained from a couple of ALS patient websites. This is by no means a comprehensive list. 
The problem with this is that all dietary supplements are not created equal. Many of these are ineffective. They can be toxic, particularly when they're taken in combination with one another. So how is a patient to know which of these supplements will benefit them and which ones are not harmful? That's where I hope my work can come in. I work on mitochondrial oxidative stress and neuroinflammation that we believe underlies the motor neuron death in ALS. Now, those are big words. So oxidative stress, a simple, simple definition of this is you can think of free radicals, free radicals that damage key cellular proteins, lipids, and DNA and lead to cell death. There are several sources of free radicals. Mitochondria are an organelle within cells that are normally responsible for making energy. However, when they're damaged, they produce a lot of free radicals. In addition, those microglial cells and astrocytes I mentioned that are part of the inflammatory process in ALS, they also produce free radicals. This leads to oxidative stress and ultimately motor neuron death. So we think that targeting oxidative stress could be a great way of mitigating and limiting the neuronal death and helping ALS patients maintain muscle function. And a class of drugs that we can use to do this are what's called nutraceutical antioxidants. Now, where do nutraceutical antioxidants come from? Some of our favorite foods, green tea, strawberries, milk, dark chocolate, red wine. I wish I had a glass of red wine right now. <laughs> um, that being said, the two that we're working on right now are compounds in strawberries, known as calistephan and a compound called cystine that is in whey protein that we can isolate from milk products. So what we do is initially we take these compounds and we look at them in neurons that we've isolated from animals and put in a culture dish. And I'm going to show you some nice pictures here. Basically what we're doing is we're treating these cells with an oxidative stressor in the absence or presence of the nutraceutical antioxidant and see if we can get neuroprotection. So here in the upper panel, the green is staining the actual mitochondria in the cell. The lower panel in red, we're staining for a lipid called cardiolipin, which is localized ex exclusively to the mitochondria and is required for mitochondria to make energy. So you see our control cells have very nice, healthy mitochondria loaded with cardiolipin. When we induce oxidative stress in these cells, we basically obliterate the mitochondria and the cardiolipin becomes oxidized. These cells can't make energy, so they die. And I think the picture says it all. Calistephan, the strawberry compound, completely preserves the mitochondria and the cardiolipin in these oxidatively stressed cells. So this is a really dramatic effect. We see similar effects with the whey protein supplement that has that cystine compound. Here in green, we're staining the microtubule network of the cells. You can think of this as the cell's skeleton. It allows the neurons to talk to one another and make connections with one another. In blue, we're staining the nuclei. This contains the genetic material or the DNA of the cell. So control cells have really nice microtubules, large intact nuclei. When we stress them with oxidative stress, you can see the microtubule network disintegrates and the nuclei become very small and condensed. The DNA is being chewed up. And I don't know, I think a picture says a thousand words, right? The whey protein supplement completely protects these cells from oxidative stress. And actually in about three plus years of doing these kind of studies, this is by far the most dramatic effect that I've seen in tissue culture experiments. So with these really exciting data in cell culture, We've now moved into an ALS mouse model. This is Eve. Eve is the first ALS mouse that we put on this whey protein supplement. And these mice have a mutation in SOD1 that mimics the genetic form of the disease. Now, these studies unfortunately take several months to conduct, and so I don't have any earth-shattering data to show you. But I can tell you that we have several ALS mice that have been on the supplement for about eight weeks, and my graduate students tell me that they are a lot fatter, a lot more active, 
And they genuinely appear a lot happier than their, their siblings that do not have the whey protein supplement. So we're really encouraged that this supplement is probably, at a minimum, delaying onset of disease. So my take-home message is I hope that nutraceutical antioxidants can provide a new hope for ALS patients and that our work can help them make informed decisions about which supplements are safe to take. Finally, I'd like to thank the people who do the work. My graduate students, Heather Wilkins and Natalie Kelsey, are out here in the audience. And an undergraduate, why don't you guys stand up. Stand up. That's great. Um, Whitney Hewlett, who couldn't be here, she's an undergraduate honors student as well. Um, these guys have really taken a vested interest in this project, so I appreciate that. And lastly, I'd just like to thank uh, the people who give me the money, the National Institutes of Health and the VA, for their support. And thank you for your attention.